All right, guys. Uh, thanks for coming out today. Uh, again, my name is Captain Bill with Hubbard from Hubbard's Marina. Uh, Hubbard's Marina is located over in Johns Pass, Madeira Beach. So just over the bridge, uh, about 45 minutes from here. Uh, inside Johns Pass is where our party boats and charter boats are located. We, do, uh, we have two different party boats, and then we have four different uh, private charter fishing vessels. We do anything from two inches of water in the back bays out to uh, past a thousand foot of water. So any type of fishing you want to do out there, guys, grouper, snapper, pelagics, whatever it is. If it swims in the Gulf, we got a trip to go get it. Uh, so today's seminar, we're going to kind of focus on nearshore and offshore fishing. So if you guys want to hear about grouper fishing, snapper fishing, pelagic fishing, whatever type of species you guys want to catch, that's what we're here to talk about today. Now, we're going to cover a bunch of different stuff, uh, but I don't like talking at you guys, I like talking with you. So, if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand and uh, we'll talk about what you want to hear about. Because I don't want to stand up here and talk the whole time, guys. I want to answer your questions and hopefully talk with you. So, how many of you guys own your own boat uh, larger than 25 foot of water, or 25 foot? Those of you guys who do own your own boats, Smaller boats, mostly fishing near shore. Very cool. All right, so most of you guys are going to be fishing on a buddy's boat or on a charter boat or party boat then, huh? All right. So we're kind of catering to setting our boat towards that. One thing I always like to start out with is what's going on now and what can we expect. Right now, it is October. Uh, we're coming into November. We're finally starting to get our cold front started. Really, really interesting part about this time of year is timing your trip. Trip timing becomes hugely, it becomes paramount this time of year. And please keep in mind, we don't control the weather. We have to work with the weather. Part of offshore fishing, guys, is working around the weather and then also occasionally, hopefully never, mechanical issues as well. But uh, weather issues do arise and they become more frequent this time of year. These cold fronts, these low pressure systems come sweeping in from the north, uh, the northwest and come across the nation and come down into the Gulf. As these low pressure systems approach, also a low pressure system is our hurricane. They're both considered low pressure systems. As these low pressure systems approach the Gulf of Mexico, the fish can feel it. Uh, this salmon, for example, is it's not such a good example because it's hard to tell, but you'd think of a snook, or this one's even better. See that line down the side of that salmon? The snook has that same line, grouper has that same line, trout, everything. Every fish that swims in the water has that lateral line. That lateral line is how they sense movement under the water. That's how they sense predators approaching, that's how they sense prey approaching. They don't use their eyes very much, they use that lateral line to be more aware of their surroundings. So that is also a weather barometer for them. So they can sense when a low pressure or a high pressure system approaches or exits the area. So as these low pressure systems, low pressure systems uh, enter the Gulf of Mexico or approach the Gulf of Mexico, what will happen is those fish will get very excited. Because a low pressure system equals bad weather. So bad weather, they know they're not going to be able to feed. They know the water's going to get murky. They know it's going to get rough. Uh, so those fish will get very excited as those low pressure systems approach. For example, tomorrow we're supposed to have a cold front. Well, I call it more of a cool front because it's not going to be very strong. So that's a good example. So as that low pressure system enters the Gulf of Mexico, these fish get really excited. Today, I've already seen some of the photos of the boats coming back. They did very well. The group of bite was really good today. I expect the hogfish bite did really well. The half day, uh, we've been averaging like 120 to like 180, maybe 200 uh, fish. The half day got almost 350 today. So. The half day did well, the one uh, six hour trip on the Flying Cup 2 brought back six or eight grouper for just a couple guys. So the grouper are biting well, the snapper are biting well, and that's all because of that low pressure system approaching. Those fish are excited, they know something's happening. As those low pressure systems approach, the fish feed really well because they know the weather's going to get bad. When the weather does get bad, when that front does come through, when the barometer does take a dump and uh, stays low, that's when the fish kind of shut down. Uh, a, it's too dangerous to get out there to them because the weather's blowing and it's nasty. 
and then B, the water gets all murky because it gets really windy and rough, and then C, the fish get really shocked because the barometer takes it down. So a lot of times with these cold fronts, the water gets really cold really quickly. Uh, so those fish go into a little bit of shock, or what I get, what I call lock jaw, and they don't feed. And then a couple days later, based on the strength of the front, the water calms down, the wind calms down. Once that happens, 12 to 24, maybe 48 hours later, based on the strength of the front, the water clears up. Once the wind calms down, waves calm down, the water clears back up. Those fish are shut off, locked off. All of a sudden, they turn back on, and it's all out crazy again. So it's very important to time your trip around these low pressure systems. Most of you guys, I assume, are locals, uh, so you have that ability to time your trip. So it's very important to think about that kind of stuff as you go fishing. Now, as we approach the spring, the opposite will happen. We'll have the high pressure systems. A high pressure system is similar to a cold front, doesn't have as predictable of an effect on the fish, but it definitely does shut them down. A high pressure causes the symptoms of a high pressure are a blue sky, not a cloud in the sky, no rain, really sunny, beautiful, gorgeous weather, but there's a strong breeze. And that breeze is always out of the east. So a high pressure system, we get an east wind, we get a bluebird sky, it's gorgeous on the beach. But the further you go from shore, the more exponentially rough it gets as you get further from shore because of that east breeze. And a lot of times the fish start getting that long jaw. Fish feed best. It doesn't matter if you're bass fishing, you're snook fishing, you're trout fishing, or you're in an 800 foot of water fishing for grouper. Fish feed best on a moving barometer. When the barometer's going up or down, typically a falling barometer is best. A static barometer, when the barometer's either really low or really high, or even in the middle, stuck, not moving, not so good. They make a, when I was a kid, I'll never forget, they, uh, there was this clock looking thing in uh, our office, and it was a fishing clock, and it had a barometer in it, so it showed the very measured pressure. And it, as it went around, it would say good, bad, better, example like that. So it was really cool to watch the barometer move and try to pick up on things like that. So that's one important variable this time of year. And those cold fronts between three to five days are how long it will affect the weather. So like this cold front, for example, the fish was really good today. It wasn't knock down, drag out stellar because the front's not that strong. But it won't be bad weather for very long. It's going to be a little rough Sunday way offshore. Inshore, it's not going to be bad at all tomorrow uh, because, again, it's not a strong front. Monday, it'll start getting better. By Tuesday, I would assume stuff will be getting back to normal. By Wednesday, fishing should be back to really normal or a little bit better than normal behind that front. Uh, if this front was really strong, if we were expecting 40, 50 mile an hour winds and a huge front line and a bunch of free, pre-frontal activity, it would be Thursday or Friday before everything was back to normal and the fishing got good again. And the fishing would have been even better today. So you really got to think about that weather uh, as we approach this time of year. One good thing about our website, hubbardsmarina.com, name dropped it there, caught it. Uh, we do have brochures up front, guys, if you want to grab them before you leave. Uh, our website uh, does, under fishing trips, we have a weather links page. Even if you're not fishing with us, even if you're fishing on your buddy's boat, if you buy your own boat, if you have your own boat, if you want to go fish with somebody else on a different part of the state, check out that website under fishing trips. We have the weather links page. Now, work really hard to try to keep that up to date with some of the best weather links that I use when I'm going out fishing to look at the weather. And what I use to look at the weather for you guys. Also, when you book, if you book with us, use your email because we send you, a, not only do we send you a confirmation email, a reminder email, and a thank you email, but we also will send you weather information. For example, this 39 hour that just went out yesterday, this, this, that, yeah, yesterday, uh, we sent them an email two days before about the weather, how we expect the fishing to be really good, and how we're not worried about the front coming in, etc. So that allows us to be very communicative when we don't, when we need to be. 
If you don't hear from us, that's a good thing. All right. Uh, so that was a little bit about the weather. As far as what's going on now, as this water cools down, right now the water's in the mid to high 80s. As this water cools down, we're expecting, hopefully, we're expecting that cold, uh, kingfish run to happen. Because of this red tide, the kingfish haven't really come into the beaches. We have a bunch of bait and a bunch of mackerel around that are not as thick as they could be. Hopefully, as the water cools down, the red tide will go away, and that bait mackerel will attract those kingfish. Hopefully, what doesn't happen is that they'll go around us. So they're out there in that deeper water all year round. Past 124 water kingfish, 365 are always out there. But this time of year, in the spring and fall, we're supposed to get a really big push of them. But if this red tide stays here, that water doesn't cool down to the right degree, right temperature range, about anywhere from 70, really 78 to almost 73 degrees is really optimal. Even 72 degrees is optimal for the kingfish and mackerel. The best range, I would say, is 73, 74 to about 75, 76. That's primo kingfish mackerel water temperature. And that's why they're in the deeper water all year round, because out there in the deeper water around the loop current, the water temperatures are more stable throughout the year. The long story short, we're expecting a kingfish run, hopefully. And then also, as the water cools, gag grouper will come in closer. Gag grouper will become more aggressive, and we'll see higher numbers of gag grouper pop more shallow. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, and then also the hogfish should pick up as well. Hog fishing gets really good as the water cools down. Uh, January, February, March, we see a really good push of hogfish, March being kind of the peak. But all the way through the winter time, we see some good, good push of uh, hogfish. So we're looking forward to all that stuff coming up. Real quick, we're going to get ready for questions here, but real quick, I want to make sure everybody's got a raffle or a raffle ticket. This is the last call for the raffle. If you don't have any raffle tickets, come on up real quick, we'll hand them to you. This will be the last one to be hand out, guys. Now, does anybody have a question uh, about a species of fish they want to learn more about? How you doing, guys? Thanks for coming. All right, so does anybody have any questions? Man? How does the red tide affect the uh, quality of the fish? Uh, that is a great question. Her question was, how does the red tide affect the quality of the fish? Red tide does not affect the edibility of fish. I was thinking about how to phrase that. Uh, if a fish is healthy and you catch that fish healthy, he's alive, he's acting normal, he's fed, they're not going to feed if they're not healthy. So if he's fed and he fought like normal, that fish is completely 130,000 percent healthy to eat. It does not affect the fish edibility. What red tide is is it's a living organism, uh, and this area has Canara province or however the heck you pronounce that. Uh, but that certain type of algae is what causes red tide. Red tide algae uh, it gets into a lethal concentration. And the concentration has no effect on the fish. It's actually the uh, ability of that concentration to kill fish is dictated by the nutrients present and the maturity of the cell. So if you have super mature cells, you have a lot of nutrients around, even if you have low concentrations of red tide, you can have a fish kill. This is completely natural. It's been documented all the way back to the 1500s that we've had red tide in our area. So red tide is completely natural unlike the blue-green algae in Lake Okeechobee. That's a whole other center. So the red tide, as far as the red tide is concerned, what it will do is, once it's in these concentrations, it will take the oxygen from the water. Once the oxygen is out of the water, the fish can suffocate. Also, the red tide will, uh, the algae perish. It has a short lifespan. Once the algae perish, it settles in the substrate. And once it settles in the substrate, the bottom becomes toxic. Uh, Brevitoxin is released. The brevitoxin gets into the water column, fish breathe it, it goes into their bloodstream. Once they have bioaccumulation levels, meaning it gets in your bloodstream, you have a bunch of the toxin in your bloodstream. Once it reaches a certain level, of that will kill the fish. So they can die of suffocation from lack of oxygen, they can die from brevitoxin bioaccumulation. Once they die, they float to the bottom, they rot, then eventually float to the surface. So people point at dead fish and they say red tide. No, 
Red tide is a living, out, uh, living organism you cannot see unless it's in super high concentrations of water will turn to rust color. But overall, the dead fish you see are a symptom of red tide. And as a symptom of red tide, I wouldn't eat a dead fish off the surface. That's definitely 100% not safe. But as far as the fish that you catch, totally 110% safe. The dolphins, all that stuff that's dying has a lot to do with that bioaccumulation of the gravitoxin. As far as humans go, if you don't have asthma or COPD, if you're a healthy, normal, or I should say, a healthy individual, sorry, I apologize. Uh, if you're a healthy individual, uh, you can be exposed to red tide for extended periods of time. It's not going to cause any serious damage. Uh, and also, you can swim in it. There's a lot of people saying you shouldn't even be on the beach. The beach is toxic, all this stuff. It's crazy. It's all, in my opinion, complete malarkey. I'm no scientist, I'm just a fisherman, but my family's been doing this not over 90 years. Uh, and we moved into this area in 1908. So we've been here a while. I've had a lot of experience with it. 2005 was a much worse red tide. 1972 was the worst red tide in history of our area. Literally, our boats couldn't leave the dock. There were so many dead fish in Castle Grove, that's where we were located at the time. The boat couldn't leave the dock. The motors would stall because they couldn't get water to the engines. So this is not the worst red tide we've had. The air is not toxic, the sand is not toxic, and the fish are safe to eat. Hopefully I answered your question. <laughs> All right, guys, any other questions? Wow. Oh, uh, that's a good question. When I was talking about water temperature for the kingfish, was I talking about surface temperature or overall water temperature? Well, kingfish are a pelagic species. Pelagic species like kingfish, wahoo, cobia, tuna, billfish, they're in the upper part of that water column. So typically when you're talking surface temperature, or excuse me, uh, water temperature for kingfish, typically you're talking about that upper water column. Because that's where those kingfish and mackerel will be hanging out in the upper water column. They do go down to the bottom. For example, if the water temperature is super hot, you still can catch kingfish at the bottom. For example, right now, out around the middle grounds, it's 120 foot of water. The sea surface temperature on the top might be 80, 82 degrees, but down on the bottom, it's that perfect 75, 70 degrees. And in that temperature range, you get kingfish. In shore, at 40 foot of water, the water surface is 80 degrees, the bottom is still gonna be about 80 degrees. But as that water temperature, or as that water depth increases, you have thermoclines. Thermoclines are different layers of water that are different temperatures. And very, very commonly, even this, this summer was some of the worst thermoclines I've experienced. We had a really, really slow vice uh, red snapper in some areas, and then other areas were totally on fire. In the areas that were slow, you could drop your lead to the bottom and retrieve it. And when you retrieve that lead, the lead is literally cold to the touch. And it's like 98 degrees in the air, but the water on the bottom is so cold, it cools your lead so much that it was actually shocking when you grab it. And that was an area that the fish wasn't very good because those snapper were moving away from that cold water. And you do have these areas of water currents and water eddies and water thermal currents that will change the way the fishing occurs. That's why if it's slow in one area, we move to a new area looking for different variables that are going to be more conducive. Any other questions? Redfish. Redfish. This is near shore and offshore fishing center, just so you're aware. No, <laughs> uh, redfish this time of year, spring and fall, they go offshore spawn. So you'll see schools of redfish offshore. What they're doing is they're out there in a big group in a spawning activation. Uh, so do your best to avoid them, but it is a lot of fun to go cast on a few of them. Uh, but they are very weak. If they're far from shore, you don't want to get around them because they, they get very weak. Like we've run into those redfish pipes or redfish spawning aggregations hundreds, a hundred miles from shore and the water is boiling with red and it's all redfish. And when you catch them out there, they're so skinny and sickly looking because they haven't eaten in weeks. Uh, but near shore, they're super healthy and, and you can't target them. Uh, and they are great fighting species. We love it. Yeah. 
they're spawning. They're spawning. So ultimately, it's very hard to get them to chew sometime uh, because, again, they're spawning. Right? When you got that on your brain, you're not thinking about the shells. So uh, a lot of times, it's very difficult to get those fish to chew. But you will find them very hungry, especially further from shore. But overall, they're lazy because, again, they're focused on one thing. So if you're using dead bait, a large cut dead bait right now is the best bait for, uh, for redfish. Uh, further from shore, you can find the schools and you can target them. But where you're going to catch them the most is where you don't see the schools. Uh, especially the passes or along the beach or just offshore, in those areas where those fish are transversing to go offshore, and that's where you're going to catch the biggest ones. A large piece of dead bait on the bottom. It doesn't really matter what you use tackle wise. If it's this large piece of smelly dead bait like cut mullet, cut ladyfish, an old, almost rotten crab, uh, cut in half, anything that's really smelly, really oily on the bottom. You've got to catch a nice big redfish. It's not me. Literally, John passed the day before yesterday. There was a tourist, never fished a day in his life. He came in with a uh, salt, or it was a freshwater, like big cat bass casting uh, with like crimps and glow beads. It was just a crazy looking rig. And he said he had caught nine redfish in 40 minutes under the bridge using dead shrimp. Dead frozen, like rotten shrimp. And uh, it was impressive. It, it shocked me. So it, right now, there's a lot of redfish moving through the passes and offshore this fall. And the best way for is something really stinky and smelly way in their body. Because as that school moves by, if it's easy to eat, we're going to eat it. Yes, sir? Uh, right now, uh, you cannot, on our boats, his question was can you keep a redfish? Uh, on our boats, you can never keep a redfish because we're a federal fishing vessel. We have to adhere to federal fishing laws. And in federal waters, redfish are closed. Because the only time redfish go into federal waters is to spawn. So they're always closed in federal waters. On our boats, no, you can never keep a redfish. In shore of nine miles in state waters, you can keep redfish if they're in the slot limit. However, right now, due to red tide, they have closed redfish and stuff until May 2019. So FWC and state waters have closed snook and redfish. Uh, there is a slot limit on redfish, uh, but as long as they're in the slot, you're able to harvest them. But right now from, I think it's northern Pinellas County, you want to double check this, but I think it's Pinellas County all the way to like Everglades City area, there's a closure on snook and redfish until May 2019. Yeah, if you go up to Newport Ritchie, that area, I, it, it is open up there. Yeah. But again, double check that closure area. Don't quote me on that. Any other questions? You guys don't want to hear anything about fish when we're all here for the free trip? <laughs> snapper? What kind of snapper? Mangro snapper? Yeah. Alright, one thing about snapper fishing is you've got to use the right tool. Uh, snapper are super smart fish. Uh, especially mangrove snapper. Mangrove snapper are one of my favorite snapper species to target. Uh, the guy who can go out fishing and catch mangrove snapper consistently throughout multiple trips is definitely the most experienced angler. The reason why is that mangrove snapper is such a smart, quick biting, very, very, very cool fish, and in my opinion, very good eat. So, mangrove snapper, there's a few tricks to help you master mangrove snapper. And if you master mangrove snapper, meaning you can go out there and catch them consistently, in my opinion, you are a master angler, and you can transfer that skills that you've learned to any other species out there. They do very, very well. So again, they're a quick biting fish. So if you get good at catching mangrove snapper, you're going to get good at catching a lot of other species. And they're also very smart, so you have to present that bait naturally. You have to hold bottom naturally. You don't have to, you have to know when to set that hook. And if you master that, that skill will transfer across the species. As far as mangrove snapper go, the first thing you want to do is make sure you're using the right tools for the job. Uh, definitely, uh, really, really helps to have this on your side. This is a double snow bait. A double snell rig is basically just two hooks on one leader. And that allows you to put 
a piece of bait on these two hooks, and anywhere that fish puts his mouth on your bait, he's going to have a hook in his mouth or near his mouth. And it's going to increase your ability to hook those mangrove snapper two, two to three times more. Uh, your catch ratio goes up significantly. It is a really, really good rig when you're using dead bait. Whether you're using dead sardines, dead red fins, cut squid, this double snow rig is lethal. So with the double snow rig, I'll typically use a plug bait. And a plug bait is simply uh, something like a thread fin. This is what we provide on our boat is a thread fin. And with that thread fin, the first step to uh, baiting that thread fin up is you always cut off the tail of that bait. That way that tail is not going to make your bait spin on the way to bottom. The second step to create that. Nobody tell anybody. That didn't happen. We'll edit that out. So the second step is uh, again cut. The first step is cutting the tail. Second step is cutting off that head. Now you're left with just me. And then what I'll do on these thread fins is I'll cut the belly. I'll trim the belly. It helps to have scissors. I do this with bay shears when I'm on the boat. That way I can stand at the rail and do it really quickly. Just snip, snip, snip. With a knife it's a little bit more difficult, uh, but it does work really well. So now you've got your your head cut, your tail cut, and I trim the belly. What trimming the belly, what trimming the belly does is it opens up this belly cavity. So now all the guts that are sitting in that belly cavity are all open to the water. And you've opened up that belly cavity so you're releasing a lot of juice uh, and oils. And then now you're left with a serious chunk of meat. And that meat is also very hydrodynamic because it's very uniform shape. If you just cut it, uniform rectangular shape. So what you do with that guy now is I want to make sure that this bait is going to go to bottom without spinning. This is the skinnier, more thin side of the bait. The, sides, the head side of the bait is thicker, more rounded. So I want that head side of the bait, or I want the skinny tail side of the bait pointed at my weight. And the reason why is as this bait goes to the bottom, that weight is what drags the bait to bottom. So as it goes to the bottom, your hook gets right alongside of your main line. So if there's any hydrodynamic drag, if you hook it improperly, if it's hooked odd, it'll spin around your main line. And by the time you get to the bottom, it's not going to look natural. You're not going to be able to feel the bite. And you're going to be frustrated because you're going to reel up and you're going to have a tangle. So it's very important that you hook your bait in a manner that prevents it from spinning. So what I'll do is I'll put that fat end of the bait on my first hook. Because that first hook is closer to that fat end. So that way is, the second hook is closer to the skinny end. That way that skinny end will be pointing at my leg. So the first step is putting that hook in perpendicular to that silver and blue line. Burying that hook all the way through the bait until it comes out the other side. Once it comes out the other side, I'll turn the shank of the hook parallel to that silver and blue line. And then the second hook, I'll put right about a quarter of an inch behind the eyelet of that second or the first hook. And again, perpendicular to the silver and blue line. Once I'm all the way through to the other side, I'll turn it parallel to that silver and blue line. Now I've got a really, really pretty. Uh, very straight hooked bait. And that bait is very, very hydrodynamic because that skinny end is pointed down towards my weight. The fat end is up. It's very oily and nasty. And my hands are covered now. Uh, and that is a very, very, very uh, lethal and successful method uh, to catching those fish uh, because. Not only is it really smelly and oily, but now it's going to go to the bottom naturally, and you're going to be able to present that bait naturally, and you're going to have a much higher chance of hooking that mangrove snapper. Because wherever he bites that plug you just created, he's going to have one of those hooks in his mouth. Uh, so it makes it really, really, really easy to catch more mangrove snapper more consistently using that plug bait. The second trick to it is using the right hook for the job. Uh, these octopus up eyes are what I really like. Uh, they work very, very well. Uh, I like the owner hooks as well. The idea is you're using a thin wire hook with a small bar. 
The larger the bar, the harder it is to drive that hook into the fish's mouth. The smaller bar makes it easier to cut, uh, puncture the fish's mouth, uh, and it makes it easier to uh, hook that fish. Your hookup ratio is much higher with the thinner bar. However, with a smaller bar, you got to keep pressure on that fish. Because if you stop reeling, he's able to spit the hook really easily. Well, the barb is all it's meant to do is keep the fish hooked. So once that hook is through the fish's mouth, the barb keeps on the hook. A thinner barb means more hookups, but a greater chance of losing that fish on the way to the surface. So you've got to keep pressure on it. So personally, for mangrove snapper or any snapper species, I, use, I like a thin barb hook, like an owner hook for these offshore angler bass pro hooks. Also, thinner wire. You don't want to use a super four times double strength hook for mangrove snapper because the thicker wire diameter means it's harder for that uh, hook to puncture the fish's mouth again. So a thinner wire hook gives you a greater hookup ratio. You have a better chance of sinking that hook. So thin bar, uh, thin wire equals a really good mangrove snapper hook. Double snout rigging. Use fluorocarbon, use a small swivel. A lot of times I'll see guys with swivels rated for 250 pounds, and they're only using 40 pound tackle. So match the swivel up to your tackle. I typically use around 120, 140 pound swivels, because that's going to be good for any line that I fish with. And then make sure you're using the right lead. I only use the right, I use, on a party boat, I'll use the same lead as everybody else, because it has to be uniform. But if I'm fishing on a smaller boat or a charter boat or my buddy's boat, and there's only a few lines in the water, I'll use lighter lead. You just want to use enough lead to get you to the bottom uh, and keep you straight up and down. Typically, the deeper water, like three to four ounces, is all I'll use. Uh, now, also, you want to make sure you have the right tool for the job as far as your tackle goes. This rod has a real sensitive tip and makes it real easy. Uh, the thinner, the lighter the rod makes it really, really easy to peel these bites. Uh, so a more sensitive tip, a good backbone, something that's going to be able to hold those fish up, uh, works very, very well. So you want a sensitive tip, you want a light rod, you want something with a good backbone. We just came up with these Bull Bay Hubbard's Marina rods and they work very well. This thing's got a real sensitive tip to it, it's got a super crazy strong backbone to it. And we have the snapper and grouper models too, uh, but we've been selling through them like crazy because they're so well balanced. So look at some of the rods out there, guys, and pick something with a good backbone, a sensitive tip, something that's well balanced and light so that way you can feel that bite, but you also have the power to land that fish. As far as the reel is concerned, I like using these two speed reels, whether it's an accurate uh, a vet or a Shimano Talica or a Daiwa Saltis or Daiwa Saltiga. Uh, that was my personal favorite is the Daiwa Saltiga. Uh, I use an LV50 uh, two speed. The two speed reel is really great because it's basically like you're fishing with two reels in one. Not only are you fishing with a high speed uh, four off size reel, but you're also fishing with a low speed, almost like a six off reel. So these high-end two-speed reels have a lot of drag, they're very light, and you have the option of fishing low speed or you have the option of fishing high speed. The higher the gear ratio, it means really easy hookups, a lot of line retrieved into the reel with very little effort, and makes it really easy to hook the fish and get those fish to the boat quickly. So a high-speed reel is awesome for snapper fishing. However, you don't have much power, so if you hook a big fish on a high-speed reel, you're in a pickle. It's tough to get that fish up off the bottom. Whereas with the two-speed reel, with the press of a button, now you're at a low-speed reel. And that low-speed reel makes it really easy to get that fish up off the bottom. You have to crank a lot more, but you retrieve less line in the reel with every retrieve, and you have a lot more power. So the higher the gear ratio, the quicker the retrieve, but the lower the power. The lower the gear ratio, the slower the retrieve, but you have more power. Real quickly, for example, I'll show you what I'm talking about. So this is, again, a two-speed reel. So we're going to look at the lead here. Right now, we're set in fishing mode. 
I've got a set to strike. I'm at high speed, so I'm ready to fish right now. And I just looked at my spinning reel. There's some good hooks right there. All right. So uh, I'm ready to fish. Now look at where my lead is. I'm going to turn this handle one revolution. So I've got my lead there. I'm going to turn that handle one revolution. That was a little bit more than one, but you got the idea. Basically, that lead moves almost five feet with one revolution of the handle. Whereas if I put it in low speed, again, you see where the lead is. All I'm going to do is press a button. Now I'm in low speed. See where that lead is? One revolution of the handle. It hardly moved at all, barely a foot. Now, the lower the gear ratio, you have, you have to crank the line more to get that weight to the boat, but you have more power. Uh, real quickly, I'll show you that aspect. Can you stand up for a second? I'm going to use the guy to line it. Big man over here. You hang on to it as well. Yeah, exactly. So I'm in high gear ratio right now. Typically what I'll do is I'll set it in high gear ratio and I'll set this drag for mangrove snapper. So I can pull out drag. If I wrap my hands around it really cool, I can pull drag pretty easily. So that's how I'll fish with this reel because I'm gonna fish for most snapper species and I wanna be able to set the hook quickly. So now I feel light and I'm gonna set the hook. You got it, just hold on to it. So I'm gonna set the hook and I'm gonna start cranking. Well, I'm not gaining any line because the fish is pulling hard. So all I have to do is press the button, push the drag forward, so now my drag is increased. Now my, uh, the speed of my reel is lower. And now I'm able to retrieve line much easier. It's a lot harder to hold on to. So that is a good example of, thank you, you just dropped it. Uh, that is a good example of how just a quick adjustment to the drag and a press of a button can change the reel from a high speed reel to a low speed reel and your power is so much more. It's crazy. So that's why I like those two speed reels from snapper fishing. How often are you out there fishing with a plug like this and you catch up a lot bigger than you intended to? Now, when you're using a single high speed reel, it's tough to get that big grouper off the bottom. But if a big old guy comes and swallows this and I'm using that two-speed Saltiga, a simple adjustment of the drag, I press the butt, I'm going to get his butt off the bottom and into the boat. And so it makes it really, really cool for that reason. I think I covered everything there, there for the, the mangrove snapper. Does anybody have any other questions? Howard? Um, if you get a with that bait, Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, these fish aren't very smart. They have a two-second memory on average. So what happens is the mangrove snapper, they call them a snapper, uh, and that has to do with how they feed. They'll come up and they'll hit the bait. And they'll actually do a circle and come and clean up. So that's why I like that plug so much. Is when they come up and hit it, it just explodes with juice and oil and fat. And that fish will do a circle and he comes and cleans up the pieces. And when he turns around and clean up the pieces, he's hopefully going to get one of your hooks. So a lot of times when you're mangrove snapper fishing, you'll feel that bump and then bump, 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 bump. And that's what he's doing. He hits it hard once and then he comes around and cleans up the pieces. So it's really, really important to be ready for that. So when he's coming around to clean up the pieces, that's when he's ready to feed. So as soon as you feel that big bump, you're ready to put the hammer down. So that next bite is coming. So really, really cool. And then if you miss them, like Howard was saying, you can a lot of times, I'll see people, they feel a bite, they start cranking, they miss the fish, and they'll keep cranking all the way to the boat. No, if you, if you start cranking and you miss that fish, stop and drop it right back down the bottom. Because if you have a fish on your bait actively you feeding, if you miss him, drop it right back down to him. A lot of times, he'll go right back after him. But if you crank it all the way to the surface, you lost that fish. So I always, if I feel a bite, crank, set the hook. If I miss it, I stop, drop it right back down the bottom. A lot of times, you have two or three shots at a fish. If 
before you miss that fish completely, it steals your bait. So always, if you miss the fish, drop it back down to the bottom and wait and see if you can get another bite. Typically about 60 seconds. Because that fish is on that bait feeding. So if I miss them, I'll drop it back down. I'll wait about a minute, maybe two minutes or so, depending on how big the bite was, uh, to see if the fish is still there. If it's not still there, I'll crank it up and check my bait. Uh, but when you get good at it, when you're using really, really nice tackle, like that really sensitive rod, or that well-balanced light rod, you should be able to feel it. What I mean by that is, if I've got my bait on my hook, and I've got my lead, when I've got this on the bottom, when I'm sitting there fishing, I set the hook, I miss him, I drop it back down the bottom, and I wait a minute, he's not there. What, I, what you should be able to do over time is you should be able to lift your rod tip up and you'll feel that weight pick up off the bottom and then you'll feel your bait pick up off the bottom. We can walk over here so I can show you what I mean. So a lot of times you've got a little bit of slack in your line. When you've got a little bit of slack in your line uh, because of the drag, you can, I like keeping my thumb and four fingers on the line in front of the reel. So I miss the fish, oh, I miss them, drop it back down the bottom, and a lot of times you'll be able to, you should be able to over time once you've had some practice, you'll be able to lift the line up, I felt the weight pick up, and then you'll be able to feel the weight of the bait pick up off the bottom. So you'll feel the weight pick up, and then about three to four feet later, you'll feel that bait pick up. And the weight of the bait should tell you how much bait you have on there. So over time, you'll be able to know if that snapper took your bait without ever retrieving, without ever having to reel that hook up to check your bait. And once you get to that level, it makes it really easy if you miss a fish and drop it back down the bottom. That all takes practice and just getting out there and doing it. I like dropping down the bottom. When I first drop down the bottom, I'll drop down the bottom if I don't get hit right away. I'll wait a minute or so, and then I'll do that. I'll lift my rod tip real slowly to the sky and set it back down the bottom. And what you're doing is you're straightening out your leader on the bottom. Because a lot of times, how often, how often is your, your hook going to land on the bottom of your gear, your, and your uh, lead's going to land on the bottom over here, and your leader's going to be perfectly straight? That's not going to happen very often. A lot of times your hook's going to land right next to your lead, and it's not going to look very natural. But after a few seconds or a minute, if you haven't gotten a hit, you load, you raise your rod tip up real slowly. That's going to lift the lead off the bottom. And the current is going to help you straighten out that leader. The current will help you straighten out that leader and the movement of the boat. So now your leader's nice and straight. Your bait is on the bottom. Your weight's on the bottom. And it's going to appear much more natural. And your chances of catching a big quality fish are greatly increased when that bait is presented naturally and that leader is stretched out on the bottom. Any other questions? What? Gear for grouper is just bigger. That's what you want to do. The bigger is better when it comes to grouper fishing. Uh, for grouper fishing, if you want to catch a big old gag, bigger is better. A uh, big bait, Big tackle, big fish, but you also have to have big patience. And it really takes, you're, you can catch 200 mangrove snapper before you catch that 40 pound gag. And it takes a lot of practice. And once you hook that fish, which is difficult to get them to feed, once you hook that fish, you gotta be able to get them up off the bottom. It's a whole different ballgame. So it's very difficult to catch big gag group because they're very aggressive, they're very quick to break you off the rock. Uh, and they're homestead grouper, they, they hang around the rock. He's not gonna bite your bait if your bait's 100 yards from his rock. He's gonna wait until that bait is right next to his hole. He's gonna be able to ambush that bait and run back in his hole and break you off. So that's why they're so difficult to catch. A, because if your bait looks unnatural at all, you've got no shot at hooking that fish. And then, once you finally do hook that fish, you gotta be able to get them up off the bottom. Certain times of the year, you'll get those aggressive gags that'll swim that away from the rocks. You'll pull them up, but you can't hook you in the bottom, way far away from this hole. You'll bring him to the boat, he's got that white belly, 
That white belly shows that he's been out stabbed in the movement. That darker belly, he's been hanging out in his hole. And then there's a rusty belly that we just want to talk about right now. Uh, but uh, the, the rusty belly is even a more dominant aggressive group. We're basically, group are, uh, I forget the term for it, but they change sexes. They start out as males predominantly. Then once they're about 18 to 24 inches, they'll switch with a uh, female. And then one grouper in an area will remain a male. And will be a big dominant male. He, that's his area. Those are his females. That dominant gag uh, male will have that rusty belly. That's what they call a rusty belly gag. It's just a big aggressive dominant male. That's why it's so unique to catch. Because it's very difficult to get that dish up off the bottom because he is so aggressive and quick and smart. He's been around the block. Alright? So the idea for gag grouper is just big tackle. Typically when I'm gag grouper fishing, a minimum of 80 pounds full apart, but typically around 100 pounds full apart. If I'm going for a really big gag with a really big bait, I'm looking 25 pounds full apart. Using something like an 8 odd hook or these nine odd hooks, or even bigger ten odd hooks. You got to use a really big hook, something that's going to be able to be as far as the thin bar, the thin wire. I was talking about snapper. You throw that out the window. You want to use a thicker wire hook, something that's going to be able to hang, hang on and not bend out, and a, a much heavier tackle. Uh, you're a much heavier leader, and you want to use a bigger low speed reel, something like. This big old nine on. This is school with a 100 pound test. It's got a 125 pound leader and it's got a big 10 ounce circle hook on it. So this would be more apt for that big dad group of fish. And I'd be using a really big bait on here, something like a, uh, a big pink fish or a pink fish or a large squirrel fish or a, even a large corgi. Uh, a one, two, or three pound bait. Something that's really, really big to attract that really big aggressive group. You can use dead bait too, uh, but personally, most of the time when I'm fishing dead bait, I'm going to be fishing with the saltiga. Uh, but if I'm going for grouper, if I know I'm in an area where there's grouper, I'll use heavier tackle. For example, when gag yeah, grouper are open and I'm fishing a big ledge, I'm going to be using 60 pound fluorocarbon for the snapper instead of normally what I would use would be like 40 or 50. The idea behind that is if I do hook the gag, I'll have a chance to get them up off the bottom using that two speed reel and using that heavier floral carpet leader. But the trick to grouper, the gear for grouper is just go big. Bigger is better. Uh, and you have to have patience because that grouper, one of the coolest things I ever did uh, growing up was uh, learning how to dive and learning how to steer fish and going out and just sitting on the bottom watching the fish. You can do the same thing with how scuba diving by looking at some underwater footage. You take a GoPro out fishing with you and put a little chum on that GoPro and set it down and let it sit on the bottom and watch the fish. As soon as that chum gets to the bottom, the little snappers come out, the pinfish, the squirrel fish, the lizard fish, then you'll see the gray snapper, the grunts, the vermilions, the lane snappers, you'll see them come out. Then you'll see the red grouper show up. Then you'll see a scant lingering back there. And then eventually, after a few minutes, you'll see a huge shadow of that gag grouper. And he'll hang out so far away you can hardly see it. And he'll do a circle, he'll disappear for a while, then he'll show up again, he's a little closer. Then he'll disappear for a while, show up a little closer. He's doing circles. Checking that bait out, he's getting a little closer, he's fast. After 5, 10, even 15, 20 minutes, that fish will be close enough and will eventually feed. For that entire time, that bait has to appear natural. If you're sitting up there talking to your buddy, drinking a beer, holding your rod with one hand, that lead's bouncing on that bottom, that bait's moving. That's not natural. You have to con constantly move your rod tip with the boat. Dance with the boat, move that rod tip. The boat's going up, my rod tip's going down. If the boat's going down, my rod tip's going up. You're keeping your line tight enough to feel the lead, but not tight enough to disturb that lead at the bottom. Because for example, with this big old nine ounce reel, I've got an eight or 10 ounce lead on here, and if that 10 ounce lead is getting moved on the bottom, 
It's creating a huge puff of sand, a lot of noise, and you have no shot at catching that gag. But if you're moving with the boat, you're dancing with the boat, you're paying attention, you're keeping that line tight enough to feel it, but the, excuse me, not tight enough, not tight enough to disturb that lead on the bottom, that is when that bait is perfectly still and appears natural. And you've got to hold it for 15, 20 minutes. And it takes a lot of patience. So that's why a big tackle with big fish and big patience will pay off in the big group. But it is not easy. And you have to be in the right place at the right time of year. All the variables got to be broken on your favor. And you got to be able to hook once you actually get up the bite, and you got to be able to get them off the bottom. So it is not easy to catch a lot of people. But it does happen, and this is the time of year to do it. As the water cools down, those fish come shallower. It's a lot of fun. But as those fish come shallower, that becomes less necessary. Something like the two-speed reel with a high drag or like a six op is more common. Any other questions? Cobia? Uh, Cobia is definitely an interesting subject this time of year. They're starting to show back up. That's for sure. One of my favorite baits for a Cobia is just simply a white bucktail uh, with a good enough weight to cast and then these rubber worms you put on there work very well. This is actually a packaged product. Uh, it's called Bucky Eel. It's over there on the shelf. Uh, but most places don't sell something like this. Only I've only ever found it here. Uh, but you can make your own pretty simply by taking one of your favorite white bucktails and just putting a green Senko worm on it with Senko bass worms. Uh, so a soft plastic worm on one of these white bucktails is a great casting for a cobia. Because a cobia is a sight fishing fish in our area. We don't actively hunt cobia uh, like they do in the northern Gulf of the beaches. Uh, in our area, we're out there bottom fishing, we're snapper fishing, we're grouper fishing, and a cobia swims up. That's when you want some rig up to cast it. So something like that lure, on a spinning rod that has plenty of casting distance, like this 7 6 rod, I'm going to be able to cast a mile with this thing, especially with a heavy bucktail like that. So you're able to spot that cobia swimming up, reach up, and grab that out of the rocket shooter, and uh, sight fish that fish. You want to present that bait naturally again, so I'm going to overcast that fish. Let's say, let's say this bag is my fish, I'm going to cast over it. That way I can present that bait, work that lure back in front of that fish is not natural. If you go cast at that fish, you're going to spook it. If you cast too close, you're not going to be able to start the action of that jig. And it's not going to look natural and it's not going to chew. So you want to cast past it, retrieve it in front of the fish's mouth while you're working that jig. Also, you can use live bait, a tail hooked pinfish with 40, 50 pound fluorocarbon. A 5 off circle hook is a great option for cobia. So if you just keep a rod up in your rod rack that's got 40 pound fluoro, 50 pound fluoro, and a 5 off circle, and you're ready to grab that down and hook a big fish and flip it out to that fish, that'll work well for you too. Uh, you can catch them on a dead bait occasionally. Typically, you have to have a flat line out. You really should always have a flat line out. Uh, this time of year, you can see kingfish, you catch a lot of tuna. We actually just caught a yellowfin tuna, oddly enough. Uh, but you can catch tuna, you can catch cobia, you can catch sailfish, you can catch a lot of different flagged fish by having that flat line out. If you don't have a flat line out, you miss these fish. Just in the last month, we caught sailfish, yellowfin tuna, cobia, wahoo, and more. All by having that flat line out. While we're down at the bottom, catching Amberjack, that flat line is going to catch any pelagic species we can buy, especially on the party boats. When you've got a bunch of lines in the water, a bunch of people fishing, you're creating a chum line, and those pelagic species will swim off that chum line. And your flat line, if it's out there, you got a shot at landing one of those fish. <coughs> so, as far as cobia are concerned, you've got two options. You can sight fish them once you see them, or you can have a flat line out ready for them. 
Uh, if you don't have any live bait for your flat line, I like just using a thread fin, uh, just like I showed you before, just a thread fin out uh, on a balloon. And the balloon is going to bounce along the surface on the waves, and it's going to work that thread fin. And as that thread fin bounces, if that, if that balloon is making this thing do this, the water foam is flashing, that smell is out there, and something will come up and eat it. Uh, if you have a live bait, that's even better. A lot of times, the tail of the fish works really well for tuna, cobia, uh, a lot of different species. Blue runner is typically average for your kingfish or your wahoo, uh, and it depends. I mean, kingfish, wahoo, you're going to want a wire uh, stinger ring for it. tuna, cobia, doughfish, you're going to typically want just floral carbon and no wire. So you've got to kind of pick and choose what you want to catch and see what's out there, see what's swimming by, or just go for it, gamble and see which one you got, right? Uh, but typically we use wire because kingfish are the most common. Any other questions? Yeah, you can cast on a party boat, you can find, but you can't overhead cast. You underhand cast. So it, it works well, especially on a party boat that's larger, off, higher off the water, it's really easy to underhand cast. Uh, and that's why a lot of times I'll use a shorter rod, not something that's eight foot, not something that's super crazy long. I'll use something like six and a half to seven foot, so that makes it really easy to underhand cast. Five thousand series Yeah, for your flat line, a five thousand series spin reel works fine. Uh, you can use a uh, six thousand series. You can use a two thousand series. Your your you're, you're not worried about breaking that fish off or that fish getting in the rocks, so you don't need a lot of power, but you do need enough line capacity. Line capacity is the trick. If you hook a 40 pound wahoo, those fish can swim 70 miles an hour. If you hook a 40 pound wahoo, he's screaming 70 miles an hour and he's fighting you real hard. If you have a 4,000 series spin reel, you don't have much of a shot at landing that fish. But if you're using something like uh, a big four-out reel uh, with a bunch of braid in it. I mean, that thing can swim a couple miles. Then you still got a shot of catching. Uh, also, obviously, if you are drift fishing and you start to go in and chase the fish, you got a better shot there too. Uh, but ultimately, a lot of times on a party boat, I'm going to opt to use something like one of these reels, uh, like a small. Uh, jig fishing reel, this is a motion master, or it's a, yeah, motion master reel, right, right? Uh, and uh, this is meant for jigging, but it also works really well for flatlining. That's what we use these reels a lot for, is flatline fishing. And you fill that school with braid, and you're going to have a lot of line capacity, more so than you would with a 6,000 or 5,000 series spin reel. But you get a big spin reel, and that's 5, 6,000 range, you fill with braid. You're going to have sufficient line capacity to catch just about anything. But if you want that big old sailfish or that big rock loop, you're not going to have as much of a shot. But if you're on a tower all day, 6,000 is all you need. Any other questions? Hogfish? Uh, we typically catch hogfish about 30 to 70 foot of water, anywhere from I've caught a hogfish at Don Pass Bridge before, but anywhere from about uh, three to four miles to about maybe 18 miles is typically where we see hogfish. But I've caught hogfish at the bridge before, and we've caught hogfish in the middle grounds before. So you can catch hogfish anywhere, basically, but there are very, very difficult fish to catch because they're one of the last ones to feed, and uh, it, they're a very smart fish like those mangrove snapper. Uh, and they're very, very easy to shot, so you have to use super light tackle. Typically, hogfish are the last ones to feed, so when you get anchored up on spot and everybody's catching fish, those bites are going really well, the bites are consistent, everybody's happy, and then you get to that point where it's like, alright, the bites are kind of consistent, kind of slowing down a little bit. Then you get to the point where it's like, alright, no one's really catching anything, there's just no one's getting any bites. That's when you want to start targeting hogfish. Once everything else stops feeding, that's when the hogfish is ready to feed. So typically, I'm out there using something like this. Uh, like, for example, if I'm fishing 40 foot of water on a half day trip, I'd be using this rig right here. 
double scale rig uh, with this setup, and I'd be using two pieces of squid to bail gray snapper or grunts. Uh, catching a bunch of those fish, maybe some rain snapper days in the 40s, catching a bunch of them, and then all of a sudden the bite's going to slow down and stop. And when the bite slows down and stops, that's when I'm going to turn around and get my spin and tackle set up with a super sensitive light rod with a good backbone. And I'm going to drop this down with a knocker rig or a naked ball jig or a jig head and a little piece of shrimp. And that's when you're going to catch your hogfish. And hogfish are, uh, they travel, in, uh, or they don't travel, they uh, live in harems. So for every male, there's about six to eight females. So when you catch one hogfish, there's a lot more there. And once one hogfish starts feeding, all of them start feeding. So once, it's just like a light switch. Once you catch one, that light switch is on, and all of a sudden you're catching a bunch of them. But as quick as they started biting, they'll stop biting. It's just as fast. So it's very difficult because you've got a fish in spot until nothing else else feeds. Then you'll catch one, you might catch a half dozen more, and then they shut off. Now you've got to go to another area and fish until they stop feeding to start targeting the hogfish. So one thing we use to cheat is this super shrimp. It's by Aquatic Nutrition, it's for fishing chumps. They got it right over there. Uh, and the super shrimp is a super hard compact pellet. That pellet's going to rock it to the bottom. So it makes it really easy to get up anchored up on the spot, throw some of that out, and it's gonna sink to the bottom quickly. By the time it gets to the bottom, it's breaking down into powder, and it's just concentrated shrimp. So it just gets that smell going in the water, the hogfish really start to fire up. And those other fish get fed a little quicker because they're eating the chum, and those more aggressive fish are gonna get out of the way a little faster. So that aquatic nutrition sport fishing chum works really, really well. They make it a, a bunch of different kinds of products, but for hogfish, super shrimps is awesome. Any other questions? <laughs> for kingfish? For jigging? Yeah, it depends on what type of jigging you're doing. Uh, I mean, slow pitch jigging, you need a really specialized rod. But for most jigging, like I brought a bunch of jigs up here because I was hoping someone was going to ask me about that. Because uh, jig fishing is becoming more and more, excuse me, more and more popular. Uh, vertical jigging is a great method to catch grouper, snapper, amberjack, kingfish, tuna, everything bites a jig. Uh, so they're a lot of fun. But most fast pitch, flutter pitch, knife jigs, uh, most of those medium to fast jigs, you don't need much of this fancy rod. Uh, it does help to have a lighter rod because the lighter rod's going to enable you to work that uh, rod and work that jig a little bit longer. You know, I don't stand enough if you're not using that nine on with a 20 pound rod in your hands. Uh, so a lighter rod does help for that, but you don't need a special rod to work a fast pitch jig. Yeah. Yeah, I jig a lot with the setup. With jigging uh, a faster pitch jig, you're going to want a fast action, stiffer rod. A slow pitch jig, you're going to want a slower action, a little softer rod. But anyway you slice it, you're going to want something that has a lot of backbone to it. And the trick with jigging is you're not going to force that fish. Once you've got a hook, you're just going to steady crank it. If he's running, you let him run. All right, guys. We are out of time, so we're going to quickly, uh, uh, Brian, if you could shut us down over here, uh, we're going to do 